for, for their uh, efforts in um, uh, uh, conceptualizing this program and also the uh, tireless and, and always strong efforts of uh, Ambassador Joey Quisha and the Philippine Embassy for making the program happen. So CSIS is really uh, the third wheel here. Uh, we are uh, just happy to be able to host, host you all, uh, but we really appreciate the leadership of both these organizations. Um, it's my honor to uh, introduce today uh, the chairman, uh, the co-chair of the U.S. Philippines Society, a man who was ambassador uh, to the Philippines, ambassador to Mexico, uh, head of the uh, U.S. intelligence agencies, um, someone who held many um, important positions in the U.S. government, is also vice chairman of uh, McClarty and Associates Consulting, um, John Negroponte. John, uh, would you tell us what we're all about? Thank you uh, very much, Ernie, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to uh, Secretary uh, Sing Song, Ambassador Quisia, Secretary Romulo, Secretary Gary Lau, other uh, distinguished participants from the Philippines and the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the U.S. Philippine Society is uh, privileged to join with CSIS in sponsoring this timely uh, symposium on Typhoon Haiyan, one year after the most powerful storm in history struck the Visayan Islands. I'm, I'm delighted to welcome such an impressive lineup of participants, including leaders from the Philippines, from the State Department, uh, USAID, foundations, the private sector, and experts on preparedness, all of whom worked hard over the past year to assist those in need after the storm, and who continue to provide leadership needed to complete the recovery and build resilience. Uh, their job this afternoon will be to share with you insights on response and recovery in the wake of an unprecedented natural disaster. They will review lessons learned with an eye on shaping responses to future challenges. Each sector represented here has a vital role to play. Philippine institutions, international donors, including U.S. agencies, uh, the NGO community, and business. Their complementary efforts over the past year were, in many ways, a model of good response teamwork. But the involvement of so many different entities can pose challenges to effective uh, overall coordination. Our goal today is to learn through sharing uh, perspectives and to increase public awareness of continuing recovery needs. You'll also hear about the Philippines' continuing vulnerability to the forces of nature. The good news is that the public-private partnerships uh, partnership initiatives from leaders like Secretary Romulo are underway to strengthen resilience even as rebuilding after Haiyan continues. Today's Philippines is reaching new heights of achievement from responsive democratic governance to record-setting economic growth. Completing the Haiyan recovery and building preparedness can help assure this progress continues and offer people the prospect of a safer and more secure future. So I want to uh, thank you for your interest uh, and support and welcome you all uh, to this symposium. Thank you very much. I'd like to now uh, invite uh, our, our moral and uh, uh, our moral leader, uh, Joey Quisha, uh, the ambassador of the Philippines. Ambassador. Thank you, Ernie, for, that, for those very kind words. Uh, Secretary Rogelio Singson, Secretary Roberto Romulo, uh, U.S. Philippines uh, Society Co-Chair, Ambassador John Negroponte, Mr. Ernie Bauer, Chair of the Sumitro Sumitra Chair for CSIS. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, let me thank Ernie and his team at CSIS for having 
collaborated, cooperated with the U.S. Philippine Society and the Philippine em Embassy in Washington, D.C. in organizing this forum. I'm pleased that so many of you have joined us this afternoon, one year after Typhoon Haiyan. The massive devastation brought about by this tragedy makes the effort of rebuilding an un unenviable task. It is, in fact, it is difficult to imagine the scope of the work that must have been done in the affected areas roughly the size of Portugal. However, this isn't an impossibility given the concerted effort between the national and local governments, aid organizations, and concerned organizations and individuals. Thankfully, the collective efforts have been immense. Indeed, this unprecedented natural disaster was met with an unprecedented global response that continues today. Resources were mobilized quickly and on massive scale. We're grateful to organizations like Project Hope, which delivered more than $23 million worth of medicine, medical supplies, and deployed over 80 medical volunteers. We have so many other organizations to thank that USAID, Team Rubicon, uh, Mammoth Medical Missions, and many, many other NGOs and as we have said before, we thank the American people for their generosity and the U.S. government for the very immediate and massive response that they extended to our suffering people. We are also witness the individual stories of heartwarming generosity. For example, we received a check for $1,000 from Sam, the Korean-American owner of the coffee shop across the embassy on Massachusetts Avenue, where some of us in the embassy once in a while take lunch with a troop of young Girl Scouts come to the embassy, donating all of their cookie sales for, their, for the victims of Typhoon Haiyan. With members of a Vietnamese American organization go house to house in their neighborhoods to solicit donations. Today, one year after Typhoon Haiyan, it is important for us to celebrate these acts of self, selflessness, yes, but also to reassess the lessons learned from this tragedy. We want to ensure that when faced with similar Occurrences, we are better prepared to serve and protect our people. It is our hope that as we reflect upon this in the Philippines, we also inspire others to prepare for the challenges of the future. Our keynote speaker, as Secretary of Public Works and Highways, may be the best individual to help us reflect on lessons learned from Haiyan as his office works on the rehabilitation and development in areas affected by the storm. I have great pleasure then in introducing Cabinet Secretary lauded by President Benigno Aquino during his last State of the Nation address, as well as in other State of the Nation addresses, as having cut corruption in the Philippines, particularly in his uh, department, once known to be one of the most corrupt, the Department of Public Works and Highways. That citation merited a lot of interest. A lot of people ask, why was that important? Well, in a nation where whose public service history is filled with stories of selfishness and self-seeking interest, it was interesting to hear a feel-good story. But more than just a story, I can assure you it is a new reality for the Philippines as it sees marked improvements in the public works and highway sector. As the President said, under our Speaker's leadership, the, the Department has covered holes in the old system and smoothened processes in the agency. Small but very meaningful changes, such as reducing the number of documents required for bidders from 20 to 5, have had dramatic impact. It has not only expedited processes, but more importantly, eliminated many opportunities for frauds and bribes. The Secretary takes pride in the fact that he has reduced his entire workforce by 25 percent, but tripled the output of his department. A speaker's career spans decades of work in both the private and pub public sectors as an industrial engineer and businessman working successfully in the areas of public-private partnership, water and power utilities management and privatization, management of airports, seaports, resorts, toll roads, and expressways. He helped transform former U.S. military bases into thriving economic zones under the Basis Conversion Development Authority and managed the private water services company of the Western Zone of Metro Manila. No doubt, the attention to detail and focus on efficiencies have been honed over years in the private sector, and the ability to manu maneuver treacherous politicking, something he has developed 
in working with the government. This combination of skills, his very low key demeanor and distaste for the limelight has kept him under the radar, but not for long. He's continuously being recognized for his efforts, which speaks loudly enough for someone who would rather be quietly working. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming, welcoming my fellow LaSalle alumni, businessman and public servant, the current Secretary of Public Works and Highways of the Republic of the Philippines, the Honorable Rogelio Lazo Singson. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Quisha, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, in spite of the long travel, I had to oblige knowing that you're also from La Salle. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Ambassador John Negroponte, co-chair of the U.S. Philippine Society, Ambassador Quisha, Ambassador Roberto Lo Romolo, Ambassador John Maisto, my old friend, good friend, Ambassador Tom Hubbard, Mr. Ernest Bauer. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Allow me again to thank the Philippines, uh, U.S. Philippine Society for inviting me to this event, Typhoon Haiyan, one year after. Uh, before I start, I, I would like to also express on behalf of the victims of Typhoon Haiyan our heart, heartfelt gratitude for the assistance giving to our, given to our countrymen. Uh, can, can we have the slides on, please? Okay. Let me get used to this setup. Uh, Allow me to start by saying that it has definitely been very challenging to make the decisions and necessary actions as quickly as we could, given the scale and magnitude of the devastation, the huge funding needed, and considering the effect on the government facilities in the typhoon path, and as well as on government employees who were also themselves victims. In addition to Typhoon Haiyan was uh, we had two other calamities, one man-made, and this was in the Sambuanga siege by Muslim rebels in the southern Philippines, and a month prior to Haiyan was the devastating earthquake in the province of Bohol. So this was one, coming one after the other. Having said that, the typhoon Haiyan should not have been so surprising since the Philippines experiences an average of 20 typhoons every year and that the Philippines, we are aware, is considered among the top three countries most vulnerable to climate change. However, the only difference is that Typhoon Haiyan was packing the strongest typhoon to make landfall in recorded history. This is the path of uh, Typhoon Haiyan with a width of 100 kilometers. We call this the type Haiyan Belt. It affected close to 1.5 million families and displacing over 900,000 families. Total recorded fatalities 6,300 and 1,600 more persons missing. The initial estimated total damages and losses is placed at close to 13 billion US dollars and the initial estimated costs for recovery and rehabilitation for both public and private is estimated at 8.2 billion US dollars. The affected six affected regions has a total population of 29.5 million, and this contributes 17.4% of the country's G GDP. Unfortunately, the, the bulk of the population of these regions are already considered relatively poor, with the average income of these affected provinces only at 75% of the national average. And also these provinces have already high malnutrition rate. So this area that was hit is already considered poor with high mal malnutrition rate. President Aquino thought it best to create the Office of the Presidential Assistance for Rehabilitation and Recovery, or OPAR. This is headed by Secretary Panfilo Lacson. Unfortunately, I understand Secretary Lacson could not make it today. 
Secretary Laxon, after consultations with line agencies, local government units, and coordinating donor institutions and humanitarian organizations, submitted the Comprehensive Rehabilitation and Recovery Plan to President Aquino sometime last August. We call this the CRRP. With the completion of the plan, it also signaled, keep in mind, we had already transitioned from relief to rehabilitation at that point. The CRRP total funding requirement is placed at 3.82 billion US dollars. The breakdown is as follows. There are four major components. The infrastructure has an, a budget of 35 billion or 0.8 billion. And this is uh, infrastructure component or cluster is headed by the Department of Public Works. So we handle, or put together all the, the requirements for rebuilding damaged roads, bridges, airports, and all the other infrastructure facilities. The resettlement component, which is the biggest component of all four, accounts for 75.6 billion or 1.75 billion US dollars. This requires the construction of 205,000 housing units, which was identified jointly by the local government and the national government agency. This called for a resettlement requirement of close to 2,000 hectares and which was not easy to locate or to identify in those areas. The third is the livelihood component, which uh, in involves the provision of livelihood assistance, fishing boats. This was also done in collaboration with uh, the private sector. And the fourth component, the social services, which accounted for 26.41 billion. This included cash for work, shelter assistance, scholarship grants to those victims so that they could finish their their schooling for that calendar year, and construction materials assistance. The construction materials assistance component are given to those families whose houses were damaged and who could be allowed to rebuild where they stayed. Because what we did was remove uh, all those families or informal settlers that were staying in what we refer to as high hazard areas or those on the shorelines. So uh, that's what the resettlement component is resettling, the 205,128,000 2, housing units. So far, of the total amount needed of uh, 167 billion, 52 billion pesos has been released to the various agencies, including some of the local government needs for their own rehabilitation of local facilities. Now let me share, uh, because of limited time, go straight into lessons learned. President Aquino adopted the Build Back Better policy in the reconstruction efforts. We did not agree to just allowing them to reconstruct based on old designs. We had to redesign and upgrade our standards for, for more resilient school buildings, hospitals, even houses, to be able to withstand 250 kilometer force wind. The Department of Science and Technology and the weather station Pagasa, or weather bureau Pagasa, had, have been directed to modify warning systems for more effective early warning and better community awareness including the new storm surge alerts. We did not have storm surge alerts before. This is now part of their uh, warning systems. We also realized that many of the national agencies and local government units did not have the cap capability to plan, design, and implement infrastructure projects of the scale and magnitude brought about by Yolanda. Local government units did not have enough engineering staff to be able to assess and design the damaged facilities. Finally, we realized the need for more resilient public infrastructure that could continue to be operational during and after a typhoon or major disaster. In this case, we have identified in 
in these areas either a school or a hospital or a municipal facility to be built with enough with backup power, backup uh, water, as well as backup telecommunications, so that they become effective uh, evacuation centers in the event of another calamity of this magnitude. Let me mention some of the strategic policies that have been adopted. There now has, there has been an existing cabinet level climate change commission, which focuses on tracking budgets of the different departments for climate change adaptation and risk reduction. We are deliberately increasing our investments in climate change and disaster reduction management. We believe in the principle that one dollar of investment in uh, disaster prevention can save us seven dollars of rehabilitation cost in the future. The second major policy decision was the adoption of an IWRM, or Integrated Water Resources Principles, as well as a river basin approach for effective utilization of water resources and flood management. This is something new in the thinking of government. The President recently approved the creation of a cabinet level water board as we pursue a major institutional restructuring of some 30 agencies of government involved in the water sector. Finally, because precisely of the scale and magnitude of the damage brought about by Yolanda, the President decided to create a special pur purpose office, the Office of the Presidential Assistant for Rehabilitation and Recovery, to focus on coordinating the efforts of government, the private sector, and the international humanitarian organizations. Let me do mention that there needs a better coordination between national government and the hun hundreds of NGOs, CSOs, and the, civ and the humanitarian organizations because of the level three category of the uh, Typhoon Haiyan. Let me mention some of the challenges and the measures that we have adopted. First, as I mentioned, the damaged uh, public uh, buildings did not have enough proper design engineering, construction materials, construction works, workmanship was poor. So we have upgraded the science. We have been providing technical assistance to LGUs. We've even issued a complete guide to constructing more resilient houses. We have, in, in the case of uh, absorptive capacity of NGAs or national government agencies, we have provided with the help of USAID as well as some other international agencies to provide engineering support to LGUs to help them design, implement, as well as monitor the proper construction of the rehabilitation. Project monitoring, uh, OPAR has uh, implemented what an IT-based empathy for project monitoring and fund utilization. The ability, the availability, quality, and cost of construction materials and supply, supplies are being monitored strictly. In fact, uh, OPAR has impounded or uh, confiscated, uh, I believe, over 100 million worth of substandard materials. Location of safe sites, this has always been a challenge. As I mentioned, because of the scale and magnitude, we, have to, we had to identify some close to 2,000 hectares for resettlement. And this was not an easy task. Availability and time release of funds, uh, this has been addressed and the, the President has already authorized the timely releases of funds for rehabilitation. Let me show you one major intervention, and this is the structural intervention that is planned for Tacloban, Palo, and Tanawan. The first slide on the left shows you what happened in Yolanda. A 100-year return data. As the colors get darker, that means the tide, the storm surge is about five meters, four to five meters. So in this area, that would be five meters, uh, four meters, and then as, you, as the color gets lighter, that's about one meter. 
we are designing for a 50-year return period. And the intention is to uh, create a road dike. The plan is to raise the existing national road and create a seawall, total of 27 kilometers, that will protect some 28,000 square kilometers of Tacloban, Palo, and Tanawan. Now, the president has already authorized the implementation of this major inter, uh, structural intervention starting next year. So we are confident that we will be able to protect these major areas, Tacloban City, Palo, and Tanawan, from uh, another storm surge, maybe not in the scale of uh, a hundred year, but a 50 year. Should another Yolanda happen, this is the effect. As you can see, there would be less dense. This would still be about less than one meter of flooding, but substantially safer than without any protection at all. Let me just mention in passing that we have also another project, a similar project in Metro Manila, and this is the bidding is ongoing for a 47-kilometer expressway dike in Metro Manila. I have decided to come here to thank you again in helping our countrymen rebuild lives of the victims of Yolanda, and uh, I hope that I've given you an overview of what we've done uh, one year after. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'd like to, uh, are we gonna do questions? Uh, we'll, now we'll change out the uh, table and I'll invite uh, the first panel to join us uh, up at the, up at the uh, podium. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. So can I invite the uh, first panel to join me? Um, we're back. Our next panel. Oh. Okay. Our next panel will look at uh, a look backwards, a retrospective, uh, lessons learned, and the challenges uh, from the experience of Haiyan. We're honored to have uh, a great lineup of, of guests. We need one more chair. Now that uh, now that we have seats for our our first panel, we'll start the panel. We have a great panel. I will uh, briefly introduce them and ask them each to share about uh, five to seven minutes. Uh, because it's a large panel, I ask you to work with me on that timing and, and try to keep to time. Um, our first panelist is Karen Jimeno McBride. She's head of communications and external affairs for the president's office, the Philippine, the Philippine president's office, uh, and assistant for rehabilitation and recovery. I think that's the office the secretary just mentioned. She's also a lawyer trained both in the Philippines and at Harvard, and uh, for those of you who uh, visit the Philippines, you see her on TV quite a bit. She's a, a TV star um, there. 
uh, in the news. Uh, Jason Foley is the Senior Deputy uh, Assistant Administrator in the Asia Bureau for the U.S. Agency for International Development, um, and he has uh, uh, his portfol portfolio includes uh, disaster relief uh, across Asia. So, Jason, thanks for joining us. Ernesto Garalau is president of the Zwelig Family Foundation, whose mission is to improve health outcomes for the poor. Uh, he's joined us uh, from uh, the Philippines. Uh, next to him is Claude Zukowski. Her name is Claudine, but she goes by Claude, which I really like. I, you know, I like that. I like that name. It is a she is the global disaster relief coordinator for Procter and Gamble, uh, and leads the company's disaster response program. Uh, P and G, as you'll find out, was very involved uh, in the response to Haiyan. And finally, uh, last but certainly not least, my friend uh, Renee, uh, we call him Butch. Butch Maley is president of the Philippine Disaster Recovery Foundation, which is the world's first permanent private sector disaster management organization. And he's also the head of Pacific Global One, which is an, an aviation firm. So Karen, uh, without further ado, can I ask you to take us away? Over a week ago, we marked the first year since Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda struck the Philippines. And conflict conflicting assessments have been made as to whether our country was prepared for this type of disaster or how the government responded. Some international observers have said that the pace of recovery in the Philippines is faster than what they've seen in other countries. But there have been criticisms against the government and even some protests, um, sorry, and even some protests complaining that the government has not done enough. But rather than convince you as to how to think one way or another, I think we can all agree that an objective assessment as to where we are today is crucial to determine what we've accomplished, what gaps need to be filled, and how far we are from accomplishing the goals that we have set. But to give us a perspective, to this date, Typhoon Haiyan is still the strongest typhoon to make landfall in recorded human history. And the numbers reflect this. There are 171 cities and municipalities that were affected. Secretary Singson gave it, uh, the demographs earlier, the demographics. Um, 6,300 people died. It affected about almost 1.4 million families and displaced almost a million families. But a year after, we've seen changes. Roads have been cleared and structures have been rebuilt. The Comprehensive Rehabilitation and Recovery Plan that was prepared by the Presidential Assistant for Rehabilitation and Recovery, seeks to make Haiyan affected communities better and more resilient. And this was prepared by having the government agencies prepare sector-specific rehabilitation plans at the national level and area-specific plans prepared by local government units at the provincial level. But to give you an idea of how much, um, how big this undertaking is for the government, I will let the numbers speak for themselves as well. The CRRP requires funding of 167 billion pesos, or approximately 4 billion US dollars. Now the question I always encounter is, how much has the government accomplished so far? And again, I'll let the numbers speak for themselves. As of this date, 50 billion pesos has been spent by the different national government agencies to address the needs in various sectors, from infrastructure to resettlement to social services and livelihood. And in addition, 1.498 billion pesos has been spent or delivered by the national government agencies through donations. And from the private sector, 13 billion pesos, or exactly 12.98 billion pesos, has been spent on programs, 
projects and activities for rehabilitation efforts. Now, these figures would give us an idea of whether the changes we now see can be attributed to the government or the private sector. And the numbers point to both, with the government uh, outspending the private sector by a factor of around four to one. But whether that proportion is appropriate or sufficient is for another discussion since I only have five minutes. But uh, moving forward, the government plans to spend 80 billion pesos by 2015 and 35 billion pesos in 2016. And the aim is for all PPAs in the CRRP to be met by the time the president, President Aquino, ends his term in 2016. But based on the 50 billion pesos that has been spent by the national government agencies, the completion rates vary per sector. For instance, in infrastructure, uh, there are completion rates from ranging from 20% to 100% of the targets. In livelihood, for instance, there are some completion rates that even exceed the targets. For instance, in cash for building livelihood assets program, there are completion rates of about 126% of the targets. Now for resettlement, the permanent housing units that have been built so far is less than 2% of the targets set by the resettlement cluster. And I would be happy to answer questions on why that is the case. But more than rebuilding structures and uh, chasing after the targets in the CRRP, we have made it a point to develop best practices as we go along the way. And for one, we've established the Electronic Management Platform Accountability and Transparency Hub for Yolanda, or Empathy, which is meant to track government and non-government projects for transparency. And we hope that this system could be used even post Yolanda efforts. We also established the initiation um, or the preparation and use of multi-hazard mapping as scientific basis for identification of safe sites for reconstruction and also to empower local government units and communities in strategic planning and disaster preparedness. We've also partnered with the Development Academy of the Philippines in order to train planning officials in area development plan preparation. And through this program, LGU officers will have a master's degree in area development planning for free. Uh, Typhoon Haiyan has taught lessons to the Philippines and even the rest of the world. In the holding room, I was listening to uh, Jason and Chuck uh, sharing lessons they've learned from Typhoon Haiyan. But for the Philippines, I think those lessons came at a great expense, not only in terms of the financial costs of the CRRP, but more significantly in terms of lives lost or destroyed. And with that, uh, we are reminded of the words of former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in terms of where we want to see ourselves a year from Haiyan and moving forward. And he said, we must, above all, shift from a culture of reaction to a culture of prevention. This is not only cheaper, but also more humane. So with that, I think I've kept within the five minutes, right? Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Karen. Jason, uh, can we turn it over to you, please? Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Ernie, to the Center for Strategic and International Studies in the U.S. Philippines. Society for convening uh, this important event. It's an honor to be here alongside my fellow panelists from the government of the Philippines, Procter <coughs> Gamble, Zui League Family Foundation, and the Philippines Disaster Recovery Foundation. First, uh, Ms. Himi No, USAID is pleased to have supported the Office of the Presidential Assistant for Rehabilitation and Recovery to coordinate recovery efforts in all affected areas during this past year including assistant local governments in preparing rehabilitation and recovery plans. We commend you for your leadership. Ms. Zukowski, uh, Procter & Gamble is a val valuable partner of USAID on improving the health of men, women, and children in countries around the world. In the Philippines, we are proud to partner with you and Coca-Cola on rebuilding and restocking 
up to 1,000 small family-owned convenience stores. We completed our first Sari Sari stores in Tacloban City in June and have since handed over over 50 stores to typhoon survivors. Mr. Gary Lau, we congratulate the Zue League Family Foundation for its ongoing support throughout the Philippines. USAID enjoys a strong partnership with your foundation on innovative health programming that improves outcomes by enhancing leadership and government, governance of local chief executives and health officers. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Ray Miley, President of the Philippines Disaster Recovery Foundation. Earlier this year, USAID put out a call to the Filipino diaspora to submit their ideas to partner with USAID on long-term recovery efforts, and congratulations for being selected our finalists. The partnership between the United States and the Philippines, Southeast Asia's oldest democ democracy, is critically important. Our relations are based on strong historic and cultural links and a shared commitment to democracy and human rights. As President Obama said immediately after the typhoon struck, when friends are in trouble, America helps. And thanks to the generosity of the American people, we have contributed over $140 million to help the people of the Philippines respond to and recovery from the devastating effects of Typhoon Haiyan. We gathered today to reflect and learn from our collective efforts responding to one of the deadliest typhoons on record so that next time the disaster strikes, we'll be steps ahead and communities will be more resilient. While we cannot stop shocks from happening, USAID is committed to helping people withstand them. Through our resilient efforts, we aim to save and improve lives and decrease the need for repeated humanitarian assistance. Before we take a look at how USAID is working with the Philippines to improve its resiliency, I'd like to reflect on our immediate relief efforts. After the storm hit, the United States was among the first international responders on the ground to provide aid. This was due to the excellent coordinated teamwork with the government of the Philippines, across the U.S. government, and with the private sector, NGOs, faith-based community, and diaspora. In partnership with the U.S. Department of Defense and the Armed Forces of the Philippines, we provided immediate life-saving care and distributed emergency food aid and relief supplies, including hygiene kits and tarps, to 3 million people. And together, we evacuated 21,000 people in the hardest-hit areas during the immediate aftermath of the storm. We also pre-positioned diaster disaster response experts in Manila before the storm made landfall and deployed flexible cash support that facilitated immediate purchase of rice in the Philippines. Right away, we incorporated protection measures for the most vulnerable people, including women, children, and the elderly, and those with special needs. We supported programs that reunited unaccompanied children with their families, as well as measures to prevent and combat trafficking. After helping to turn the water back on, build shelters, and repair roads, we turned our attention to longer-term recovery and resiliency. Our recovery efforts are helping affected communities to build back stronger than before the typhoon hit. Over the past year, we forged partnerships with the government of the Philippines, the private sector NGO, faith-based communities, and diaspora to rebuild lives and livelihoods and improve the preparedness of vulnerable communities throughout the affected region. Together with these partners, we are reconstructing 10 rural health units and district hospitals and building up to 200 classrooms. These are designed to withstand winds exceeding those produced by Typhoon Haiyan and shocks from an 8.5 magnitude earthquake. We are training up to 8,000 farmers on alternative crops using climate adaptive technology and up to 5,500 fisher persons on climate resilient high-value aquaculture, which utilizes all-weather resilient fish cages for milk fish production. Based on current early warning systems and evalu evacuation plans, our technical experts are promoting community-based disaster risk reduction and management to help local government units develop rehabilitation and recovery plans. In conclusion, I want to stress that our successful efforts in the aftermath of the typhoon were magnified due to the government of the Philippines' decisive leadership in responding to and recovering from this great catastrophe. The unwavering commitment and clever of efforts between the Philippines' local, regional, and national governments 
saved lives, and restored normalcy. USAID has partnered with the Philippines for more than 50 years, a partnership that President Obama and President Aquino reinforced last April by committing to work together to build climate-resilient communities. We have come a long way in a year, and USAID is proud to be a partner with the Philippines going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ernesto, uh, would you like to go ahead? Over a year ago, Ambassador Romulo and I uh, talked to the same group, and uh, we were supposed to talk about uh, the work of the Zwilig Family Foundation uh, in improving uh, health outcomes of the rural poor. Uh, but Hayan got into the way, uh, hence the appeal uh, for assistance. Uh, ZFF was specially concerned uh, uh, on south of Samar, and you can see that um, uh, the map here. Uh, specifically, 12 municipalities severely affected by the typhoon, and this was uh, mentioned by Secretary Singson. Uh, basically, you have here, except for two municipalities of Pasay and Malabot uh, on the left, are really from eastern Samar, and as mentioned earlier, 60% uh, uh, of the population is poor. Uh, 62,000 families affected, 100% of the health facilities in those municipalities were destroyed, and aside from that, uh, you also have sources of income like coconuts destroyed. Since CFF was working basically on rural health systems and to improve maternal mortality, naturally, uh, we looked at the plight of the vulnerable population especially pregnant women and lactating mothers during times of distress. What we did was an on-the-ground assessment and consultation. Uh, the need for support for pregnant mothers were identified uh, who were potentially at risk at childbirth complications. Since this was not, since this was not uh, being addressed at the moment, a lot of the uh, first responders were on fixing the facilities, giving relief, uh, doing a uh, uh, food for work program, but, um, but the program with the uh, vulnerable population, uh, especially specific uh, pregnant mothers, were not being addressed. We were, we were therefore uh, grateful for the support of the United States uh, uh, Philippine Society for its support of uh, almost $463,000 or 20 million pesos which went to the support of the recovery assistance program for pregnant mothers in 12 municipalities in southern Samar affected by the typhoon Haiyan. The program was implemented from January to July 2014. Uh, it was assumed that after July 2014, the health systems would have been stabilized and there was no need for uh, a transitional program like this. Uh, major activities, if you can see, first was consultation with the mayors and health staff on the program. Uh, it was important that the local chief executives had support for the program. Uh, had some, had, um, uh, we, we got their, um, their thoughts, uh, their commitment on the program. The next one was um, incentivizing health workers to identify the pregnant mothers. Uh, the health workers likewise were were victims of, uh, of the Haiyan, and uh, they were giving incentives to go to the uh, very far uh, villages to be able to identify um, the pregnant mothers. Uh, we also conducted health summits for the pregnant mothers, spe specifically uh, why they had to be protected, what the, um, what the mechanism will be, uh, and uh, what has to be done in so far as a program is concerned. And uh, uh, leadership training for mayors were conducted um, uh, as well as municipal health officers because at the end of the day, uh, they have to own the, their vulnerable population uh, and that uh, uh, they have to take care of them on, on, on an ongoing basis. Um, and um, 
so um, so uh, getting the mothers to um, uh, after the mothers are identified, the next question, the next is to get the mothers to seek paternal hair, uh, care services. Uh, they received uh, six dollars for every prenatal visit, uh, so that would be at maximum of four. Uh, if they give birth in a uh, uh, in a facility, uh, facilities based delivery, if it's a normal delivery, they got twenty three dollars. If it's cesarean they get $57. Uh, for, postnatal, uh, for postnatal visits, uh, they got another uh, $6, uh, especially for, which is also for the immunization of the newly, newly born. Uh, further, the, as I said earlier, uh, mayors were given training on health leadership and governance program, and this was what uh, Mr. Jason Foley mentioned uh, as part of the AID program. Uh, what were the results? Um, initially, around uh, 2,900 mothers were identified. Uh, 4,200 mothers, in fact, received the incentives. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the incentives program was given, uh, a lot of the health workers said a lot of these mothers were not seen before which means that they delivered at home, they were, not, uh, they were not reached by the health services, and the incentives program got into, um, uh, brought them to the facilities. Uh, almost 4,000 received uh, prenatal checkups, uh, at least one. Uh, 1,732 mothers delivered at the facilities, 139 delivered by C-section in hospitals. Uh, remember, uh, initially, the, the referral hospitals in the area were destroyed. Uh, and uh, if you are cesarean section, basically, you either had to go to uh, uh, Katarman or to uh, Tacloban. Uh, but this was, uh, 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 these were rehabilitated early. And 1,739 mothers had postnatal checks. But if you look at it, uh, when you look at facilities-based delivery, that's FBD. Uh, starting at 78% in 2013, really jumped to 92% by the second quarter of, 200, of 2014, which is even higher than the targeted Philippine, uh, no, tar uh, Philippine target, uh, national Philippine target of facilities-based delivery at 90% by 2015. Th th these are phenomenal uh, movements because heretofore, you're really getting mothers who had no access to go to the facilities-based delivery. Uh, so uh, even more, if, so if you can see the facilities-based delivery, it really moved from 61% uh, to 92%, uh, really moving there. And uh, the way to, the way to uh, uh, interpret it is that uh, you protect the, the, the mothers more if they go to the facilities-based delivery. Uh, the next one is that this is another, an example of uh, uh, building back better. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, there were three maternal deaths each year, and it was dropped to zero by 2014, first half. Uh, zero primarily because the lone maternal fatality happened in Tacloban. Since it was in Tacloban, it's not counted in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the area. But nonetheless, normally in, uh, in crisis, if you do not have a, if you do not have a, um, a, a protective program, the maternal deaths will spike. The same is also true with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with neonatal deaths. But in this particular case, it was really even brought down to a, um, to a lower level. Um, what are the implications of this? Uh, the first one is that um, is that the 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 mayors uh, are continuing the incentives program, and this is really uh, good news because they felt that uh, if they are supposed to protect the mothers, uh, how can they continue the program themselves? 
They're also in, um, in discussion with the PhilHealth, uh, the, the, the government uh, insurance corporation, uh, together with LGUs, continuing the incentives program as part of the maternal care package. Uh, I think this is a very good development because at the end of the day, since this is a pilot program, it now moves to it being institutionalized uh, because both local governments and the field health recognize the need really for providing incentives for very poor mothers very far away who normally do not have access to this. The other one is that from data that we have together with DOH, 20% uh, of maternal deaths are really accounted for um, uh, by mothers who uh, give birth at home and who die at home, uh, which means that they don't even have access to the health facilities. And in the long run, a social protection program like this, incentives, would have to be put in place uh, to be able to reduce the deaths from that particular segment. Uh, finally, uh, the whole issue of uh, how do you now develop um, uh, local health system to be resilient, uh, such that uh, when another typhoon comes, uh, they will not only be better prepared, but they would have, in a sense, fixed their, their health systems, transform it such that come disasters, they can easily rise up and continue. Again, let me thank the United States uh, Philippine Society for for the, uh, for the, for the uh, generous assistance uh, given, and uh, we're very proud that um, uh, the, the, res the, the resources were put to very, very good use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernesto. Claude, uh, may I invite you up? Good afternoon. In 1935, the Philippines became PNG's first international operation in Asia and our second outside of North America. In 2010, we recognized the 75th anniversary milestone of delivering on our purpose of touching and improving lives in the Philippines, and we confirmed our commitment to investing and expanding our local operations and throughout the nation. Currently, P&G has over 1,300 employees in the Philippines with a manufacturing plant in Cabuyo and a global business center located in Manila that supports one-third of our global operations. P&G Philippines markets leading brands like Tide, Ariel, Joy, Downey, Olay, and Whisper. When Typhoon Haiyan struck in 2013, we quick, quickly responded working with our local disaster relief partners like the Philippine Red Cross, ABS Sagit Kapamilia, GMA Capuso Foundation, and others to provide um, personal care and household product donations from brands like Safeguard, Pantene, Pampers, and Duracell. We also mobilized and provided trucks to be able to get those distributed to those that needed them. Working with groups like Save the Children, we help to provide P&G purifier water packets um, to help those without access to clean drinking water. These packets help to provide 20 million liters of water um, to those that needed it. Our own P&G employees gave of their hearts and times organizing charity events like Aid Couture, which was a used clothes fashion fundraiser which donated designer clothing was sold to the public. Uh, our employees spent days sorting through clothing, packing relief kits, participating in cleanup efforts um, to help the families that were impacted. Globally, our employees also generously gave from their own wallets to high-end fund drives, proceeds of which the company matched. In, company, in countries where we work, we're often aligned with well-established NGO organizations who have in-country teams, a solid record for delivering on programs, and to build a strong relationship with the government. World Vision is one of these partners that we've worked with in the Philippines since 2010. Following the typhoon, we provided 
um, grant support to, to assist their continuing efforts that are still ongoing to restore livelihoods in, in the Visayas region. Throughout this program, we're helping to support families, um, farmers and farmers and fishing communities via skills training and crop production. Our largest effort over the past year, however, has been a partnership with USAID and Coca-Cola, which Mr. Foley mentioned, um, that's committed to rebuilding, rehabilitating, and replenishing the stocks of community stores. The purpose of this program was to help people regain their livelihoods and serve the communities by providing access to products and other essentials. In the first phase, along with Drainix, we helped rehabilitate 38 public markets and 3,000 sorry, sorry stores. We stocked these hope stores, as we came to call them, with P&G products as starting capital. Along the way, we overcame some challenges, such as being able to source skilled labor, labor and materials, and infrastructure challenges of getting goods from point A to point B. We've also encouraged store owners that we assisted when it comes time to restock their stores with both P&G and other products. We felt it was important to allow them to make personal choices for their business and choose the type of products they wish to provide to their customers. Today, we're continuing to help. Over the next two years, along with USAID and Coca-Cola, we plan to rebuild and restock an additional 500 Hope stores in Lete. We're very thankful for the support of the Philippines government, um, for USAID, Coca-Cola, and all of our NGO partners, which have enabled us to reach and help so many people. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. Uh, Butch, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ernie. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you back to a previous typhoon 2000, in 2009, if I think this is the right person. <laughs> okay. This is what happened uh, to Metro Manila in 2009, and that's how the Philippine Disaster Recovery Foundation started. The president at the time issued an executive order. Um, this typhoon devastated much of the city. The rains came in from... Uh, up in the mountains. Secretary Singson mentioned the building a dike around Laguna Lake, and that's designed to prevent a similar flood happening. Um, out of that whole tragedy, there, there was born a um, public-private sector partnership, uh, the PDRF. It's made up of many of the top corporations in the country. The whole idea is that it provides a neutral setting in which companies that may not necessarily like each other or talk to each other normally that are, and that are normally um, fierce competitors can come together and work um, for a common cause. One of the more enduring projects uh, that came from that was the reforesting of the, the Marikina watershed, in which a lot of companies send their workers to uh, replant trees. We are also work with the communities in that area to, uh, to encourage them not to cut the trees for charcoal and that, in fact, to go into nurseries and establish alter alternate uh, forms of uh, making a living. Now, let me turn to what happened last year. There were three straight disasters that hit the Philippines. The Department of Education turned to the PDRF and they said, we need to feed the students that are still in the schools. And if we do it through our normal processes, we won't be able to get any of the, um, we'll have to go through a, an extensive bidding process, so they asked us to do it. And actually with the help of the U.S. Philippine Society, we were able to feed 27,000 kids for one month in 607 schools. And um, that's something that the, the, only the private sector could have done uh, that quickly. Okay, thanks. <laughs> the, uh, here's another example of how we worked with the government. The Department of Trade and Industry had this great idea about helping restart the entrepreneurs that had gotten hit hard by uh, Typhoon Yolanda. Again, with the help of the U.S. Philippine Society, we were able to uh, provide these entrepreneurs with a means in order to restart their businesses in things like dressmaking, food um, 
as food vendors, as cafeterias. This is again an area that the private sector was able to come in. The uh, Department of Trade and Industry said that it had, had they waited for the normal government process to, to take place, they would have had to gun, uh, go back to Congress and it would have taken over a year, so they asked us to do it. We're also partnering with the Office of Secretary Lockson that Karen uh, mentioned. They've gotten some funds from NGO, NGOs overseas and they've placed those funds under the care of the private sector um, just to ensure uh, transparency and everything. This is a hanging bridge in a um, very isolated, forgotten area of the country. No one's ever heard about it, but that's how students get to, to school today. There used to be a bridge there. Now the, it's, a, it's a bridge made of vines, and our whole intention is to rebuild that bridge and give them a safer way to cross over to, uh, to get to school. Now, this might interest uh, the lacrosse uh, uh, aficionados among you. With, uh, we were able to um, bring lacrosse over to this elementary school in Tacloban. It gave the kids uh, something else to uh, look forward to. One of the kids in this uh, lacrosse team had lost three of his sisters during the typhoon. One of the teachers in this school had lost, um, wasn't able to hold on to her four-year-old son. And, and, and he died, so there are, there are all these stories, but things like this uh, help lighten the load. <coughs> Last thing I just want to say is that the, the funds of the private sector are limited, CSR funds, so you can't really see the private sector as a donor all the time. The real power of the private sector is if you'll unleash us, if you'll create the incentives for the private companies to, to want to invest, to make profits, in these disaster areas create jobs. And each of these disaster areas has uh, what they call economic free trade zones. But they haven't been in use. Some of them were created as far back as 1998. And they, all the, all the, the only thing they have there is uh, just uh, grass. So we're encouraging them to make use of these, uh, uh, they call them peasant zones. If you put a business in there, there's no taxes for six years. After that, it, it's 5% on the gross. So the means is there, it's an easy, quick win, and um, it's a way to bring the private sector, not just in the Philippines, but throughout the world, to invest in these areas. The second idea that we've been working on is that the best way we can honor the 7,000 people or so that died during Typhoon uh, Haiyan is to set up an agreement before the next one happens to ensure that it won't happen again. And this agreement includes everybody, the international agencies, the national and local governments, the military, and the private sector. We have a draft of that agreement, and we hope to have it uh, signed within the month. The third area, and this really goes to the next uh, uh, panel, is that in case of a, of a major disaster hitting a um, large city in the Philippines like Metro Manila, the private sector is working on building alternate hubs for business continuity outside of these areas so that we can uh, continue to operate and we'll have the government uh, participate in that as well. And the last thing that we, we learned is that the, who your mayor is and who your governor is matters. Uh, people lived or died uh, based on the equality of their local leadership. Cities and towns are getting aid based on the quality of their local leadership. And we've seen that time and again. So, um, you know, I. Uh, I guess the last thing I just want to say, and the last thing that we've learned, is that it really is true that one person can make a difference, and that all of you in this room, the U.S. Philippine Society, and many of the people throughout the United States have been a huge help to the, the, the people over there, and we want to thank you for that. Uh, we've got some Christmas packages. Uh, somebody at the back of the room has them. In case you'd like to help personally, give um, uh, drinking water to a family or a um, solar-powered lamp. Uh, that's all available as a Christmas present. And, um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to uh, thank all of our panelists. And Ben, could, I think, could we turn the uh, projector off just for a second? Or, yeah, thank you. just so Karen's not blinded by the time she answers her question. Um, Thank you, uh, panel, for those great remarks. I'd like to open up the floor to uh, some questions. Uh, please just identify yourself and your affiliation, and we'll and, and let us know if, if your question is directed to any specific panelist. 
So uh, we'll start here, James. Uh, hi, thanks. Mike Bellington from Executive Intelligence Review. Um, it may be that Secretary Singh Son is best to answer this, but he and several of you indicated how important it is to rebuild better. But that also, and obviously you have to start with the disaster area, but that implies that really the entire country, or at least the entire East Coast, has to be drast dramatically upgraded because the next storm's not going to hit the same spot, you know. And I'm wondering what your plans are for that and whether there's been any progress in dealing with how to transform the entire, re entire coast, or at least. James, can you uh, give the microphone to the secretary and maybe who wants to take it? Um, let me mention, in the Philippines, you have Batanes Island. Batanes Island is in the southernmost tip of the Philippines. And <laughs> northern tip of the Philippines, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jet lag. <laughs> um, now, uh, historically, Batanes experiences or encounters about 75% of the typhoons that pass the Philippines. Their houses there are made of stones. They're no longer made of wood. They have adopted, in other words. Now, we're hoping that in these areas, we have propagate, started to propagate uh, typhoon or cyclone resistant houses. This means we have, we've distributed one pagers and we've started training even the local carpenters so that they start using proper design. For example, instead of using A-frames, they now put what they call cuatro aguas, four cornered houses. They're much sturdier against typhoons. We've also encouraged them to use uh, cyclone straps these are uh, materials often used in the islands of Honolulu, Hawaii, and so on, but we've never used them in the Philippines, so we've started introducing cyclone straps. Uh, another intervention is we've given them the science on how to build your, your roofs stronger against wind force. So these are small additions. They don't necessarily increase the cost of Houses, we call them non-engineered houses. These are just constructed by regular carpenters. They don't even follow any designs. They don't submit them for building permits. But we said since these are prevalent in those areas, we at least can help them build better houses than how they used to construct them. So yes, we are concerned that another typhoon like this does not affect the whole uh, typhoon belt or the eastern seaboard. So we are concerned about building back better. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, anyone want to comment? Yeah. yeah. Karen. I'm going to speak on behalf of the Presidential Assistant for Rehabilitation and Recovery. And I think on our part, one of the challenges is that we were created under a memorandum order by the President. So our mandate is limited to the Typhoon Haiyan affected areas. but. One thing we're trying to do is that uh, we are trying to develop best practices and including them in the comprehensive rehabilitation plan in the hopes that this or the things that we include there would be adopted all over the Philippines. So when we say build back better in accordance with the CRRP, this includes building typhoon resilient structures. So now we have um, structural standards with a minimum of uh, being able to withstand wind speeds of 250 kilometers per hour. And prior to that, most structures in the Haiyan affected communities could only withstand about 150 kilometers per hour. Haiyan reached wind speeds of about 320 to 350 kilometers per hour. Uh, on top of that, uh, based on the CRRP, in terms of livelihood, for instance, we've uh, encouraged exploring typhoon resilient crops end-to-end -end value change, chains, and even um, included climate change adaptation measures, and also social protection mechanisms, because we do recognize that, for instance, uh, gender sensitivity is also an issue because males and females respond to disasters differently. And an overall arc, uh, arcing principle there is also uh, making sure that poverty is reduced because this affects the vulnerability of the communities. And this is all part of building back better. So um, I think the challenge there is uh, making sure that 
once we implement the CRRP, in terms of most areas in the Philippines not having these types of measures in place yet, that this is adopted uh, in all other parts of the country as part of building back better and being more resilient. Hi, um, my name is Angelita Felix Berto. I'm from GMA7 and uh, Catalyst Writer. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend and thank you everyone for all the dedicated efforts you have uh, given to Typhoon Haiyan. Um, and, and as a member of the media, our job is to do the watchdog. So in relation to that, I have questions for you with regards to the master plan, big picture, and confidence. With regards to the master plan, Secretary Singson has mentioned earlier that I mean, the magnitude and the challenge of the task in terms of coordinating the government agencies, the NGAs, NGOs, and all that is very difficult. And, and critics of the government have also mentioned that President Nino Aquino has only signed the master plan <laughs> October 29, a few days before the anniversary of the Typhoon Haiyan. So I think you have laid out sort of a master plan for the Typhoon Haiyan rehabilitation. But my first question is that Will that include also the NGOs and the NGAs and all the other people working towards the Typhoon Haiyan um, the rehabilitation? My second question is about the big picture. I mean, the difficulty of a journalist is that I look at the government uh, statistics and then I look at, for instance, Ebon Foundation, an independent think tank, and that they're claiming that although the government has made progress, the majority of the people in the affected areas have not yet benefited from the government programs. Although I do understand the magnitude and the challenge, this is what the critics of the government is saying. And then, um, so, it, I mean, I also have looked at agency reports, media articles, and, and um, there's a big disparity in every, almost people, I mean, other journalists are, are saying the same thing. There's disparity of, statistics and claims. The third question I have is about the confidence. Um, the confidence in the Philippine government. Ms. Maybe Mr. Miley has made a point about involving businesses and private sectors. I mean, I'm sure everyone knows a few months ago there was the scathing report about the Department of Social Welfare about double accounting for the funds that have been given for the Typhoon Haiyan. And the other important thing, too, is that, one, I don't see a legal accountability of those people who are responsible for, for these plans. And then thirdly, Typhoon Haiyan rehabilitation does not exist in a vacuum. I mean, the economy of the Philippines and job, I mean, uh, developing jobs, developing livelihoods is all part of putting the Philippines forward and not just focusing on Typhoon Haiyan. Thank you so much. Karen, would you? Uh... I'll start with the first question. And thank you for bringing that up, because I couldn't really expound on the CRRP, given the five-minute uh, limitation. But uh, with respect to engaging the private sector, I think one of the benefits of Memorandum Order Number 62, which created our office, is that it included in the mandate the power to call on all entities, including the private sector, to assist in the rehabilitation efforts. And in fact, when Secretary Laxon was appointed as PAR, uh, he was alone. And he, uh, up until December, had just another staff, an undersecretary, uh, Danilo Antonio. But one of the first things they did was to engage the private sector. So January 7, 2014, they actually gathered members of the private sector and um, organized the 171 cities and municipalities into 24 areas of intervention and development and laid out to members of the private sector uh, the situation and how they can help. And with this, we were able to get what we call now development partners. So basically, uh, we have two ways or two mechanisms um, as to engaging the private sector, and this is having development partners uh, that initiate programs in any of the 24 areas, and also sector partners that are more sector specific that can span different areas. But basically, these mechanisms are laid out and included in the CRRP, because we do recognize that public and private partnership is not only beneficial, but very important in achieving meaningful rehabilitation. 
Um, and this is one thing that we want to institutionalize. It's actually one thing that we're also proposing as a matter of policy. We have currently uh, legislation that recognizes the importance of the private sector, but this is in the, more in the construction industry. But we want this to be institutionalized in terms of disaster response as well. Now, as to the second question, um, I understand that there are disparities in numbers, especially even with us, when we were preparing the disaster uh, master plan, uh, the numbers were moving. Initially, we had the reconstruction assistance on Yolanda as the basis for the damage and loss assessment, and they pegged uh, the needs at 360 billion pesos. But by the time the post-disaster needs came out, which was prepared by the Office of Civil Defense, this, numbers, this number was already 104 billion pesos. And by the time we finished the master plan, our assessment is 167 billion pesos. But even before that, when we first submitted it to the president, it was 170 billion pesos. And this actually shows why it's very di difficult to pin down a number because the targets are moving. Sometimes while we're meeting, and Secretary Singson can attest to this, when we're meeting the clusters of the different government agencies, while we're meeting there, some of the needs are being met not only by the government, but, but also by the private sector. So by the time we are updated, the numbers move again. Um, but to give you an idea, I understand why um, the survivors or the communities would feel that the private sector did more. Because if you look at what happened here, Typhoon Haiyan hit November 8. And um, November 8, that is still the relief, uh, relief or humanitarian phase. And when I, was, when I was looking at the numbers, of course, we can never agree, of course, uh, as to assessing who did more. But for me, I like to rely on the numbers because at least that gives you kind of like an accurate or more or less accurate picture. But based on the spending, I mentioned earlier that in terms of the rehabilitation or at the rehabilitation phase, 13 billion pesos has been spent by the private sector. And those are the donors that work with or report to PAR. And we have about 1,289 private donors uh, that are working with us. And when I looked at the figures for the recovery phase, they've spent about 8 billion pesos for the relief stage. Compared to the social services cluster, which is the cluster in charge of um, the relief phase, they only spent about uh, less than 3 billion pesos during the relief stage. So that gives you an idea who was felt first. And again, you're right, uh, the president approved the rehabilitation plan only October 29. So that means uh, the 50 billion pesos I showed earlier came from the regular budget of the national government agencies and some from the calamity fund, but not sufficient to jumpstart several of the rehabilitation projects or the PPAs under the CRRP. So that means I think that the presence of the government will be felt more now that the rehabilitation plan has been approved, and that would mean the release of the budget from the Department of Budget and Management all the way to the national government agencies and the LGUs. And um, three, uh, lack of confidence in uh, the government. Um, again, I cannot speak for uh, any double counting with the social services uh, sector by uh, the DSWD or the Department of Social Welfare and, uh, because they were in charge of the relief stage and we don't have figures for that because our mandate only includes the recovery stage. That means that we only know uh, what their funding requirements are and how much they've spent so far with respect to the rehabilitation phase and not with respect to the recovery phase. Thank you very much. Comprehensive questions and comprehensive answers there. Um, the young lady here in front, please. And this will probably be our last question for this panel. One more. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I am Vaughn Kathleen Iyengar. I am part of Silliman University Community Disaster Res Response Team as well as a volunteer of Gawad Kalinga. And I've had the privilege and the challenge of being at the forefront, forefront of helping people who are really there, especially in Leyte, 
in Tacloban as well as in the earthquake in Bohol. So the, one of the challenges that we've faced um, when we talked to these people was the help that they needed were not able to reach them at the right time. And also, how do you make sure and ascertain that the right people get the right help? Uh, who would like to uh, take a swing at that one? How do you make sure the right people get the right help? Ernesto, you look like you might have uh, uh, an answer. I, I'm not familiar with, uh, with, with Leyte, but I'm familiar with Summer. Uh, and um, uh, I would agree with, uh, with Karen that uh, the first responders in terms of, um, uh, because of the magnitude of the calamity, uh, were really the international NGOs. Uh, Medicines on Frontier, uh, uh, Plan International, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the, what was not lacking was the relief in Samar. What was not lacking was the relief. Uh, because we, we would go from, from, from municipality to municipality and they actually had uh, adequate relief. Because, because I always ask, we always ask, is there enough, is there enough? And the mayors and the Kwan would say, there's enough. To the extent that um, we would store that and they would do regular, regular, um, regular distribution by barangays. Uh, much more, uh, to the extent that they were gaining weight because of wrong foods, <laughs> because of noodles, rice, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I could not speak of summer, but I don't know, of uh, later, but I could speak of summer, at least the one. And, and when, you, when you ask with reference to uh, the, the initial relief, uh, I personally, we didn't see problems of complaints, but you got a lot of complaints in later. Butch, I just wanted to ask you, you, you sort of said, uh, you, have, you implied that governance matters in this area, and I wonder if, if that's part of the answer to the, to the young lady's question. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that, actually. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, what we saw is that the mayors who were very aggressive, they're the ones who got the aid, and uh, that's, uh, there are certain towns in late in summer that have moved much farther in, um, in terms of the recovery than the others, and that's, that's, that's a problem. But let me also say that uh, Secretary Laxon's office did ask us, the private sector, to focus on the areas which were neglected. There are about three or four uh, sections of the um, areas which had been hit by that typhoon which, were, which nobody wanted, which nobody had heard about, and there was no help coming in terms of recovery, and so they asked us to, to fix those things. And like that bridge I showed you, I mean, no one was moving to, 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 to help that place. And so they've, uh, they've tried to help us direct our aid there. Um, from the point of view as, of a lawyer, uh, we have a law in the Philippines called Re uh, Republic Act 10121. It's uh, the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act. And this actually delineates uh, the functions as to who is supposed to take care of what in times of a disaster. And under this uh, law, you have the Department so of Social Welfare Development in terms of relief and humanitarian stage. You have the Department of Interior Local Government in terms of the capacitating and the Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council for rehabilitation and recovery. But again, um, so ideally, the DR NDRRMC would have taken care of the Haiyan area for rehabilitation and recovery. That's why there were people questioning why OPAR, or our office, had to be created. But again, I think when this law was crafted, it did not foresee um, the magnitude of Haiyan. So they were also undermanned, understaffed to take care of something like this, along with the other typhoons that kept hitting our country. Uh, but one thing that that law is lacking is the participation or the institutional, uh, institutionalization of the participation of NGOs 
or the private sector in times of disaster, which is very valuable as we've seen in Typhoon Haiyan. So um, based on the CRRP, which also includes the participation of multilaterals and bilateral institutions, we hope that this is something that can be included in legislation. I'd like to thank the panel and uh, invite you all to uh, a coffee break for about 10 minutes. We'll switch out the, uh, this, the seats and uh, invite them to the panel. Thank you.